value where you've come from um, and who you are. Welcome to the stage, Nicholas Bailey. How do I start the tribe? What can I do? What's the next thing I can do? The most unselfish thing a person can do is expand. No other option besides hard work. How they can live this three-dimensional lifestyle. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Billion Dollar Brotherhood podcast where we are on a mission to redefine what it means to be a businessman. Literally change the dictionary definition that you cannot be called a businessman without prospering health, wealth, and relationship. And our goal by bringing all the best people together is to create transformations of the people listening to this podcast, this show, and actually take that model and consult every major world leader. And it starts with you. Thank you for helping us launch this podcast in a strong way. If you're watching on YouTube right now or if you're not, go over there, make sure to hit that subscribe button and push that notification button, which is the little bell. Yet right now, what we're trying to do more than anything is to crush it on iTunes, meaning going to your podcast app on iTunes or going to your computer if you need to and going and subscribing to the show, The Billion Dollar Brotherhood, and actually leaving us a rate and review. I'll even give a little bit of silence. If you have not done that yet, go give us a rate and review over in the iTunes store and Apple Podcasts so that we can smash the ranks and absolutely crush. We have over 95 star reviews at the moment that I'm actually recording this. I would love to shoot, see that shoot up to past 100. We want to get to 500 five star reviews and we cannot do it without you. So go head over to Apple, go to iTunes, go to the podcast app, and give us that five-star rate and review by searching the Billion Dollar Brotherhood. Today's interview is absolute fire. We just got done recording. It was absolutely insane. When I came here to Austin, I went to the number one gun range that has huge memberships as the best facility, and that is called The Range here at Austin, number one gun range. I brought the owner on. He also owns SB Tactical. He has hundreds of thousands of followers. He loves to drive Ferraris. This guy's an absolute legend. So welcome to the show, Grant Shaw. Grant Shaw, welcome to the Billion Dollar Brotherhood podcast. I appreciate you being here, man. Absolutely. Happy to be here, Nicholas. We just survived like the craziest storm in Texas history, possibly. Freezing cold. I just saw a sad picture of a bunch of animals that didn't have homes and power and things like that stay in just showed that it was out of the ordinary for what's going on here. And we went through tons of back, back and forth, forth to even, even make this thing happen from things, things on, on my side, side happening. happening. Apparently things on your side. I don't even remember. I felt like it was all on my side, <laughs> but we're here and we're making this happen. So for the people that are listening, this can be a powerful episode. Why? Cause it was so difficult to make happen. And we didn't look at that difficulty and say, Oh, maybe this isn't meant to be. We looked at the difficulty and said, this is meant to be, let's make this happen. So I appreciate you being here. Ab absolutely. Uh, it's been an interesting week and I just got back from lunch. It's 70 degrees outside, if you can believe that. So we've gone from snow to literally sunny skies and 70 degrees only in only in Texas. And for the, for the people listening to I didn't have even water or anything until a day ago. I didn't have any power really until two days ago to 70, 70 degree, degree weather. weather. It, it almost felt surreal, surreal even during like all the, the, the winter storms, storms and everything with it felt like it wasn't that bad outside right? The roads were bad and whatever, but it was not that bad out, but it just ruined everything. What was like your experience through that, knowing your knowledge, tactical knowledge, et cetera? How did you handle that situation? Yeah. I mean, for, for me, um, I, I pay attention to, you know, weather systems that are coming up, things like that. So I had an idea that there was, this was going to be a, a storm and we'd probably have a day or two of closure. I didn't think we'd end up having issues with, uh, you know, rolling uh, uh, blackouts related to the power grid having capacity issues. And then of course, the water issues that came as a result of that from pipes freezing over and breaking. Um, you know, I wasn't personally affected living downtown in Austin, which was, which was great uh, from at least from a power standpoint, we had power the entire time. Uh, but literally became victims uh, and trapped in our you know, downtown place in terms of not having access to uh, 
normal foods, dairy products, you know, you forget all these conveniences of modern day life that we take for granted, like being able to pop out to the grocery store, and get a gallon of milk. Uh, that became a non-starter for a few days. And I'm sure for those of your listeners who are from the Northeast, they, uh, or mountainous states with cooler weather look at us and uh, kind of shake their head, but we're not used to cold weather down here. And it was really the infrastructure uh, kind of slowing down and breaking uh, that caused most of the problems. But I, I think we're on the, seems like we're on the mend now and grocery stores are filling up and uh, roads are back fine. I don't even see any snow outside as I look right now. I think it's all melted. Yeah, well, people make fun of us because, like, oh, we're, we're not used to this weather. They think it's like, that we're, we don't have big enough jackets or that we don't have thick enough skin <laughs> has nothing to do with that. If they were here, they would see that there's lines for miles right outside of my house right now, just for people to get water because right. they don't have the ability to get water. It was just totally jacked up in all these different ways. So I appreciate you sharing that. And it's been a wild experience, which is fun to talk about since it's fresh and new and, yeah, and fun. I mean, so maybe I we'll even jump into some of that. I mean, I've been in Austin 20 odd years, 21 years now, and I've never seen a winter storm like that ever. So I know it's uh, goes on the record books, but it truly was an anomaly. I, we're not used to having this sort of weather, which may have started out fun for the kids, but turned into uh, more logistically nightmarish for, for us adults. But it's, it seems to be behind us now. Totally. So I, I have an idea of, of where I want to take this. And first, I want to kind of start with going backwards not backwards in your past, but I want to take this interview backwards. I want to share with some of the things that you're doing right now. Sure. I mean, I've been following your tactical. It's so weird. I follow the, one of your tactical companies and I'm like, I look at the pictures and I'm like, dude, this is like Call of Duty in real life. Like, this is the craziest thing ever. Sometimes I think it's Call of Duty. I'm like, man, this is crazy. Look at what they're doing. And it seems like a great cause behind it. I'm also a member of the Austin Gun Range as well now, my wife and I, uh, which we drive 40 minutes just to be able to go to that range over anything else. It's really fun. And so kind of tell us what you have your hands dipped into right now. And then I want to kind of take it back to some of the ways you're able to, to, to actually create that into not a passion, but a company, et cetera. Sure, sure. So really right now, and we can talk about kind of the specifics of, of kind of how I switched industries. I mean, I, I went from working for a Fortune 100 company, Oracle, for uh, over a decade in software, was successful, liked it. But it wasn't something that really got me motivated to get out of bed this morning. Uh, in the morning, uh, enterprise software. Uh, loved the people, loved the challenges, but it wasn't something that I felt passionate about. And guns, firearms are are my passion. So I, I've been fortunate that I have two companies right now that are firing in all cylinders. One of which is SB Tactical. Uh, we make a stabilizing uh, pistol brace. Uh, and uh, we've been very successful with that product, uh, although we've had our challenges here and there with ATF. Overall, it's been a wonderful experience, and we've parlayed that a couple of years into the range uh, that we have here in Austin. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've lived here in Austin for 20 years, and I've lamented the fact that we didn't have a safe, decent, uh, what I would call uh, family-friendly uh, gun range uh, in the city, and I kind of set upon myself to, to fix that um, and one thing led to another, and now we have a have a range. It's up and running. So it's 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 been an interesting time over the past year or so. But for our business, it's been very very healthy for both of my businesses. And and it's a very interesting topic nowadays. Guns, ex, uh, even tactical. Like there's a lot of different style of tactical pages out there, and different people that that people follow, and they're right. trying to figure out how they can prep for things, etc. But there's a lot of people even listening right now business owners or, or making that transition that had a job before as well. And yet they have maybe a passion or something that they're into kind of take me through the process of that, where you always into guns and you knew a lot about them and you've been studying them for 20 years, been using them. And then you made that transition or was it something new? Tell me that, that transition. Sure. Cause some people think, Oh, well I have passions. I'm not good at them. I'm not, I've never really studied them, but I'm just going to quit my job and go start this new business. Tell me the progression of that. Cause if people go check out SB tactical right now on Instagram, let's say, I mean, I just, you're thousands and thousands of likes. This isn't just like a hundred follower page. That's not really getting any traction. This has really turned into a movement as well as I say the best gun range in all of Austin, Texas, if not all in Texas in general. And so take me through that progression of how you made that transition and what was life like before that? Yeah, so uh, happy to chat about that. So I, as I mentioned previously, I, I came out of, I went to Texas A&M, uh, graduated and went into the world of, um, of technology uh, and started working for a software company and really enjoyed it. 
but as I said earlier, you know, I had this longing uh, to sort of explore the entrepreneurial side of of, of working, uh, maybe take some calculated risks. And so at the ripe age of 40, you know, I guess we hit that, uh, you know, for a lot of people, you turn 40 and you start asking reflective questions and introspective questions about what you want to do with your life. And, you know, are you in the right position to, you know, look back uh, at the point of retirement and say, I've accomplished what I wanted to accomplish, or at least tried uh, those things that I wanted to try. And uh, for me, firearms, to answer one of your, your, your earlier questions, uh, Questions. Uh, firearms have always been something that's near and dear to my heart. I'm a you know, fourth generation Texan. I've loved guns. I grew up hunting, uh, fishing, grew up outdoors. And for me, firearms represented uh, just a, a, a unique family experience with my father. Got lots of great time with him and just something that I became kind of passionate about over the years. And uh, as luck would have it, uh, was at a shooting range in Tampa, Florida, and uh, had a suppressor on a on a gun. Needed to take the suppressor off. Uh, didn't have my normal glove, and I looked over at the stall next to me, the range, the range stall next to me, and uh, there was my soon-to-be partner. Didn't know it at the time. Borrowed his uh, uh, his rag to get my can off, and uh, we started talking. And it, it turned out to be a good fit in terms of some ideas that he had, blended with some ideas that I had. Um, and we just put one foot in front of the other. I, I wish I could tell you that it was a, you know, there, there was a lot of business analytics that went behind it. And, uh, you know, we, we had done a lot of, uh, uh, market analysis. The truth is, you know, we did our best to size up the opportunity. And when we felt we had something that was worth taking the market and putting what I would say beyond sort of initial um dollars in to kind of get some prototypes done really put some money in it and get it to the next level uh felt fairly confident based on reaction that we had from the gun community that we had something that people were interested in uh and that not only manufacturers but potentially end users down the road would be you know, looking to follow and buy product from us so to, to go back to what you said Nat, earlier about you know going to sb tactical's website or ig uh, page and seeing all the followers we have I can't tell you how blessed we feel because eight plus years ago when Alex and I started, it was literally two guys. I mean, that's all we were, you know, two guys had an idea uh, and, you know, had the passion to see it through. Uh, and my experience in doing that has been has been great. But I, I think that's a combination of, you know, right time, right place, but also just having the right idea and having the confidence to put essentially our money where our mouth was and invest in our own company and see what we could do with it. And even when you're talking, I'm thinking of like the three compartments that I want to unpack, which is number one is the, the location brick and mortar based gun range. And then you have the yep. actual physical product and, and education around SB tactical. And then you have your personal and business influence online. So sure. the first one I want to kind of push on is the, business influence online or your your influence online which people go check out your instagram as well as, as well as other places yet just looking at that in itself there's many people out there that talk about similar things that you talk about or many companies out there that post about things that you post about yet you guys have seen massive traction on the social side how have you and the company been able to get massive traction in something that seems like it was an awesome hobby that other people had as a hobby as well, or so, an interest of other people. How have you guys been able to excel massively while other people may stay really small? Yeah. And I, I think part of that, uh, a large part of it goes back to just having a, a good idea and understanding where we fit within the ATF framework, uh, understanding that, you know, we were essentially creating a new product category, call it the AR-15 pistol, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, but, you know, we, we, we spent, you know, uh, what I, I think there's a, there's, there's a large part of it where you just, I hate to use gun analogies because I'm in the gun industry, but you shoot from the hip. Um, and it's, it's been a, uh, you know, it's been an interesting journey, but once you commit to it, there, there's sort of a rewarding feeling once you commit to going all in and giving something your best shot. You know, I was working at Oracle, putting my my resignation to leave a, a position that I had worked 10 years into to, to getting uh, within their enterprise sales sales division. But I just 
didn't have that sense of fulfillment. And I wanted a sense of happiness, sense of fulfillment that came from, could only come from really starting your own uh, enterprise, starting your own business. And for me, firearms was that, was that route and really haven't looked back. That's so interesting. So you say like shooting from the hip and putting stuff out there, but what made you actually think that social was a good place to do that? You could have shot from your hip and, and did other things, yet you guys went all in on social from what I can see. Yep. And so there's many people that, oh man, like I just need to post more. That's what they, oh, I need to like do more stuff. I need to maybe post, but maybe they don't even see why that's even important to post on social. That I, I talk about so many things with high level marketing strategies and all this stuff, yet a lot of people actually just, I go check out their stuff and they just aren't consistent at all. So right. what made you finally go all in on just being consistent and shooting from the freaking hip? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think, and it's interesting. So when we first started looking at, you know, and sort of using and embracing social media, uh, we provided and produced a lot of our own content. Um, and, you know, as social media started to take off and as, you know, Instagram went from being something that, for example, uh, I talk about I something that, you know, a, a small percentage of people were using to something that most people use now. Uh, the adoption of Instagram and and basically the framework of allowing people where they were sending us their post of their favorite gun with one of our braces on it. You know, we went from a world where we had to create the content ourselves to where we have an overabundance co of content coming from our, the end user community. And it was that sort of sense of buy-in from us and the support of, I mean, we like, I like I like a, a good looking gun because it's a good looking gun. If it comes from somebody who's got thirty thousand Instagram followers or three, I don't really care. I, if if it looks great, I'll put it on my Instagram page and give them a a credit for it. But we really benefited from people just getting on board and excited about you know being able to uh, to put out content that uh, you know other companies would share and repost. And that's really what we started doing. And uh, we've just been so blessed by the community. Uh, embracing the brace, so to speak, and embrace, embracing firearms, that social media has become really the only place that we uh, spend any uh, advertising dollars with the exception of a little bit of, of print media that we do with SB Tactical. The majority of it is, is social. So take us through the actual brace then. I want to hear about the product. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the uh, what we, we basically make the SB uh, stabilizing brace, which is a, it's called a pistol stabilizing brace. Um, that turns a uh, an AR-15 or a number of other weapons platforms into a pistol whereby the end user uh, can have a small close quarter combat, sorry, I'm doing my, my hands off camera here, uh, close quarter combat weapon system, has a small form factor, perfect for a bug out bag, um, you know, those sorts of applications, but utilizes uh, what's called a pistol stabilizing brace. So when I met my partner, and this is a this is a great sort of meeting of opportunity and uh, altruism. Um, you know, he had a, just come back from serving uh, uh, in the armed forces, uh, had gotten back from his last deployment overseas, uh, and had gone shooting with a friend of his uh, at a range. A friend of his who had lost an arm and a leg to an IED, uh, and part of his friend's recovery process was wanting to shoot his AR-15 again. Uh, and as, as in, a lot of your, your, your followers know, an AR-15 with one hand, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a lot to handle. And they were out of range and shooting it, but it, we're having trouble you know, keeping the gun accurate. And essentially, we're told that you know, they weren't performing in a safe way and would have to stop shooting, uh, to which my friend Alex and partner Alex took a, a front to and said, look, we got a guy who gave his arm and a leg to the country here, he just wants to shoot his gun, I can figure out a way to do this. So kind of a, essentially took the concept of the, of the wrist rocket slingshot, if any of you guys remember that, at least from my, my childhood days, we still had slingshots, uh, whereby you created a, a stabilizing platform simply by using the wrist, uh, whereby in the case of this SB Tactical, we take a stock that's been bifurcated, uh, or that essentially becomes the brace that wraps around the forearm, tighten it down with Velcro, and gives people with limited mobility the ability to uh, use the weapon in a more accurate and controllable fashion. Uh, and with that said, you, you know, the, the, the original motive um, uh, that, that we had was just addressing this market. But then we saw based on how we were being classified and being adopted in the gun industry, that there was a much larger application for small form factor weapons. And uh, we've embraced that and, and been very pleased with the results. That is cool. So for the people listening, there was they saw a need in the marketplace is one takeaway. 
right? It's like they didn't go out there and create the same exact thing, the same exact stock. They didn't go out there and create the same exact product as everyone else out there. But you saw a need, which is interesting that it wasn't really addressed in a good way in the first place. Yeah. This isn't a new industry by right. any means. Like been around for a really long time. So first off, that's that's really cool. And then also the innovation side of it. You could be like, oh no, we're just sticking with this style. We're not going to go create this other thing. We're not going to help these other people that that do have the ability to shoot a normal gun a normal right. way. You right. went out there and capitalize on that, which I think is really cool. I I, I think what I'm going to do, I want to take a couple questions real quick from some of these guys, sure. and then I have a question kind of going towards just men in general right now, since you know that, that right now we reach millions of men every single year. I want to make sure we kind of touch on a few things that maybe people are confused about because masculinity in general, it can be a negative term for a lot of people. Maybe they grew up like my dad did, where his dad like whooped his ass, right? That's like masculine to all these blisters and all these things. Right. Yet, yet the other swing is thinking that like it's all wrong, right? And there's like this healthy balance. I'd love to hear like kind of where that's going. But just one second, we'll put a pause on that for the sure. guys listening. Got to listen until after this question to be able to hear that. So a few questions. Uh, we'll take it from Will. He says, with changes in firearm and second amendment regulation sure to come, where do you see private gun ownership in five to 10 years? I'd like to, to that's a great question, Will. I'd like to hopefully say it's in the same spot. Uh, you know, I, I think with every change of administration, particularly when there's a, um, a, a change of, of, of party, you know, we tend to uh, see a lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt that's injected into the firearms community about, revising gun laws, uh, you know, taking things away that we've had access to for, for years. Um, and that makes a lot of us nervous. I, I think th what allows me to sleep at night uh, is knowing that, you know, the ability to uh, uh, have and use firearms products as they exist today, uh, it, really the, the, to change that's gonna require a lot of, um, a lot of groundswell. And I just, I don't see how uh, the draconian changes that are being sort of thrown out uh, and that the, you know, a lot of the media has seized upon about what could happen. I don't really see too much um, value in, in pontificating on various scenarios that could happen. You know, we've, one thing about being in the firearms industry is that we've lived in a world where we're, we're sort of always been under persecution for lack of a better term. So it's it's no it's nothing new to me, um, but it certainly does get alarming. And um, you know, to hear for the some of the claim or the requests that come out to to more severely limit firearms and and uh, beyond what we already have today in place. I don't know if we'll see that. Uh, it just it remains to be seen. It's it's a hard thing to tackle and administer uh, in terms of of changing firearms laws uh, without infringing upon our rights in the Second Amendment. The good thing is, is it kind of feels like even though there's a lot of negative publicity towards guns over the years, which there's probably should be positive as well. There's many positive things that happen that ultimately it feels like the publicity in general, I, I feel that maybe they're more popular than ever, maybe more hated. Yeah. I'm not sure, but more popular. It seems like I have a lot of friends that are trying to get educated, which is probably something that we could actually jump into for one of these other guys questions. Yet it seems like people are really liking guns. Yeah, I, you know, I think a lot of it has to do, and that was part of that's a, that's a, that's a great point. You know, one of the things when we uh, when I decided to build a range and gun store here in Austin is I, I really wanted to turn the the whole gun experience on its head. As, as you mentioned earlier, the the, the gun industry has been around for a long time, but it hasn't really changed much in terms of uh, product offering or even in terms of the, the way you buy guns, the training that goes associated with it. We really wanted to provide a one-stop shop with the range where somebody could buy a firearm, get training, take their uh, license to carry uh, classes if they wanted to. But it was it was about developing a relationship whereby they they join the range, come and shoot regularly, and and move away from a transactional. Hey, we just want to sell you a gun, but to really we want to get a gun in your hands and and build a relationship with you, your family, your, your business, however you're coming to us, uh, which has been, you know, a big part of of what's happened in the last year with COVID. Forty percent of gun sales have gone to first time uh, first time buyers. Um, and you know, the, one of the very positive things out that we've seen is a lot of those buyers have also been registering for training. So we've had a huge uplift in the amount of training courses that we've offered. Um, that's, you know, very tangible, very concrete that we can see as a result of these sales, which 
is, is good. So people are realizing that I can't just have it. Owning a firearm isn't enough. I need to know how to use it. I need to know how to operate it under duress. Um, I need to know how to just all the things from loading, clearing, um, you know, keeping safe from little ones that you have around the house. There's more to it than just buying a firearm. And I, I think with the community that we have today, we realize that in order to keep the rights that we have to have, we have to be smart. And so we have to you know, keep our farms under lock and key if we have children around the house. We need to you know, do the right things in terms of wearing eye protection and ear pro and you know, just really embrace the fundamental safety around firearms first. And as we uh, address that, everything else sort of starts to fall in place and we develop great relationships. You know, uh, I had a, a girl once that was one of our nannies here for Kingston, and she used to get driven here by her husband. And then afterwards, like her husband got this job and, and then she didn't feel comfortable driving. And she just, where she grew up, she just always took public transportation, never really had to drive. So driving was kind of fearful, crazy. It was just out of the norm. And a lot of the people that I've seen, I grew up hunting more so with shotguns, et cetera. Yeah. Had to take my hunter safety, cor safety course, you know, when I was 12 or whatever, 11. And so throughout that process, like I got familiar and I remember even the dogs we'd get, we had three labs growing up and when we'd have to take them to the range and they would get kind of scared at first at the range and then they'd get yeah. used to it because they were just around it all the time. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit on this because when I see most people, it's usually that they just have never been around guns. People that I've seen dislike them. They're like, I've never been around them. So I just feel super uncomfortable yet. How do we bridge that gap of, getting people out there that are uncomfortable because they should be, they're loud, right. they're scary, they're lethal. If you didn't know anything about them, that would be a kind of a scary thing. But so is going to a NASCAR race your first time that cars go by or you're like, Oh my gosh, that, I would, that was freaky. Right. You see people shake. How do we bridge that gap of getting people educated enough so that they can actually choose whether they're fearful or scary? Yeah. And I, I think a lot of that education, of course, you, you know, you can you can disseminate that information, you know, online. Um, you know, there's lots of great information, but a lot of it just really comes from you, you got to get out there and you've got to shoot and sort of address some of those fears. You're right. Shooting is kind of a violent experience in the sense that you've got a controlled explosion going off uh, in a, a device that's you're holding in your hands that it's going to have, you know, energy moving upwards, uh, sound that's that's, you know, that's loud and is, as long as you start to understand that's part and parcel and that you're in control, the gun's not in control of you, um, but that you're in control of the gun and, you know, you approach it safely, there's a there's an, an immense degree of satisfaction that comes, at least for me, from from shooting. And I, I think part of it is, is kind of the fun factor, uh, but it, it just it never gets old. I, it's funny. I had a person that I was shooting with yesterday and... Uh, when I have I have to shoot with people all the time, a lot of people who haven't shot before, and when I can see that they're nervous, uh, I always say that that's a good thing. You know, that's the right response to have. You want to be a little bit nervous if you've never shot before because it means you're listening, you're paying attention. But invariably, when they're done, they're ecstatic. It's kind of like jumping out of plane for a lot of people. When they're done, they just want to tell everybody how great it was, and it really wasn't that big of a thing. And for a lot of people, it then turns into, well, I can, I can do this. This is interesting. It focuses on, uh, you know, the ability to, to, to not only have, you know, focus on increasing your accuracy, but your breathing, uh, your, your finger dexterity. There's so much that goes into it. It's not just pulling a trigger. It, you know, it, it's, it's, there's, there's an art to it as well. And, and for me, when I get into a gun range, I've got to forget about all my other problems that I might take into there. Uh, and I just need to focus on putting, you know, the bullet where I want it to go on the target. Uh, and there's there's a, sat a degree of satisfaction that comes from that. And I think by, by people just getting involved, uh, you know, I don't think I, most of the people that I shoot with for the first time always come back two, three, four, five times. And now we have great stories based on, and great videos based on from our, our first initial ex uh, shooting experience. A little bit, there's a little bit of trepidation, and by the end of it, you know, they're telling me what gun they want to shoot and what target they want to put up, and you know, it's 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 fun to see that transformation. Do you get quite a bit of hate social media in person? You know, we accounts we we get a little bit. I mean, you have to have again, kind of going in the, the industry that we're in, you have to have thick skin. I mean, I believe in, in what we're doing, and the, the, you know, I think in any industry, you're going to have people that agree, disagree, but with firearms, it's easy to you know for people to, uh, to pick one side or the other. Um, and I don't think you have to do that. I don't think it's about choosing sides, but you know, we just deflect that, you know, uh, when it comes in and if it's, you, you know, 
something that we can address, we'll address it. Uh, if it's just you know pure fanning of the flames and trying to get a rise of it out of us, we've gotten pretty good at avoiding those sort of pitfalls. That's cool. So the second question here is from Aaron. He said, what has happened to the supply of ammunition? Does it have anything to do with government regulation or is it simple supply and demand? Will, when will it get back to normal? Yeah, that's a great question. And if, if I, I wish I, I wish I knew the answer to that. Uh, you know, we, the, one of the most frustrating things that, that I can say as a range owner right now is that, you know, we're, we're suffering from the same ammo shortages that everybody else is. And so we've, it's been almost a year now uh, whereby our, our normal shipments of, of, of ammo just get consumed too quickly. And we've had to alter that by bringing supply in from other parts of the market. But to, to answer the question, you know, I, I think as things start to stabilize um, with COVID, as more people get vaccinated and, and we start to reach critical mass where we're able to get away from a masked society and kind of return back to our norms, that some of the fear, uncertainty and doubt that propels people to buy, you know, large amounts uh, of ammunition will go away. Um, so I, I don't think there's any regulation that's impacting that so much right now as it is just, you know, unchecked demand that, uh, you know, is, is, is based on, you know, actually the, the amount of ammo that's available as well as people's fear that that, you know, might be taken away. But so people I are literally buying that much ammo. You're kidding me. Like they're, they're out there buying that much ammo where it's actually impacting things. And, and what, what are these people thinking? Like, yeah, are they, I mean, we are have... going to eat it, plant it in the ground and grow a tree? Like what's going to happen? You know, we, we, we've gone back and forth depending on what our levels of ammo are at the range and different calibers to where we would limit the amount of boxes that people could buy to where we would have no limits. And I remember one Saturday right after uh, Thanksgiving, uh, we had a large shipment of nine millimeter that came in and we decided that we'd, enough to where we could sell it by the case. And we thought, should we have a limit? And he said, no, I mean, we're, people are going to buy one or two cases. And we had one guy that came in and said, do you have a limit? And we said, no. Uh, to which he responded, great, I'll take 15 cases of a thousand rounds each. Uh, to which to us is, is a bit of a shock because why would you need 15,000 rounds um, unless you just wanted to have it? And a lot of people just feel better having that ammunition stockpiled uh, because they can get it. Um, and I don't blame them for that because it's been frustrating but as how a much is 15,000 rounds? Well, that's about $12,000 of the, of the caliber he bought. So, uh, uh, you know, happy, happy to sell it to him. Uh, and I wish we had more opportunities to sell ammo like that in large volumes. Uh, but it's gotten really frustrating for some of the other calibers. We just don't, we're not able to have the variety of ammo that we normally have. Uh, it's really been more focused on the main calibers. So Chris Borghese said, does he see a correlation of getting rid of the First Amendment, free speech, to in Rhodes abolish the Second Amendment? <laughs> getting in, a, I'm getting you in trouble now. That's 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 a tough one. Um, you know, I I, I I don't think there are any of our basic fundamental rights that are outlined in the Constitution uh, can be taken away without. Uh, are altered in a significant fashion without reaction from the people, and I think we we all we all, we all have a collective point in which we're not willing to to tolerate uh, any further re restriction of the basic inalienable rights that we've had, um, you know, for for the past, you know, for me in my case, forty some odd years of of living. So. Um, We'll wait and see and see where things go, but I, I tend to not uh, worry about those inalienable rights being taken away as much as I do about, um, you know, just, you know, the, the the fear and the uncertainty that exists that's kind of created on purpose um, to a large extent, um, as opposed to what, the, what would actually could come down the pass. I don't know if I answered that in an articulate fashion. Um, hey, I, I just want whatever you have, so that's perfect, man. I appreciate it. Last one we'll take is from Jacob Medlin. He said, should gun owners be required to hold a government issue carry permit? Why or why not? Uh, you have to have a state issue. Uh, we're talking about, uh, a, no, I don't think so. Uh, I, and I think the re if, we, if we talk about individual gun ownership um, at a federal level, the amount of information you'd have to track in terms of a database of firearms, how they're moved around. It just, at this point and where we are without having any sort of prior 
single repository of information. I don't see how you get there from a feasibility standpoint. It just would be too, too crazy to put all that data in one repository and expect it to be solid, good data. I just don't see how we get there, which is a good and thing. For, for an enjoyment standpoint, like what guns do you think people should shoot? Not just own, but should shoot in their lifetime. Like, man, like you just have to shoot these different guns or you have to test this out. Like skeet shooting, I love it. That's how, what I grew up with, right? So I'm like, that's so fun. Like shooting a target five or seven yards away from me, isn't that fun? It's not, not I don't have enough education about it. I don't know why. I'm like, I want to shoot the moving thing flying in the air that's like really fun. Uh, that's me, right? So like what guns do you believe? Hey, you guys should try these out. This would be really cool. Yeah, and, and I, I would say, you know, I would try all the shooting disciplines. I mean, for me, uh, you know, shooting a fire, uh, a handgun is very different from skeet shooting, right? They're, you know, different types of firearms, different ways in which you operate them, different goals in mind. Um, but if if I had to be buried with one gun, it, one of the guns that I love the most and we, I try to share with as many people when we shoot, it's just one of my favorites, is an H&K MP5 SD. It's an integrally suppressed 9 millimeter submachine gun. It's easy to shoot. It's quiet. And uh, you can't shoot a full auto uh, firearm and not have a smile on your face when it's all said and done. You just can't. And, and that's one of my favorite guns that we, we constantly put in. I think suppressors are, uh, for a lot of people, they're surprised at, uh, that suppressors are legal to own. Uh, maybe not in some of the NFA friendly states, but it, it really is interesting to shoot a gun that's been suppressed because when you take away uh, the sound or you mitigate the sound, you're not taking away, but you're reducing the sound, uh, the decibel uh, levels significantly. It takes away some of the intimidation factor of the gun. It also reduces some of the recoil. So one of the, one of my favorite things that I'll do with people who are, you know, first time shooters or haven't shot in a while is I'll put them in a gun, a, nine, a pistol caliber gun that's been uh, suppressed and they have no idea. My stepmother, I put her in a, a 45, uh, a 45 caliber pistol with a suppressor and she had no idea. She thought she was shooting, you know, a 380 something smaller. I'm like, no, you're shooting a 45, but you take away the sound, take away some of the recoil and it just makes it a different experience. That is Anything really cool, man. So I appreciate you. It would be the answer. I'd, I'd answer that the way I'd answer that question. Shooting something full auto is cathartic. It really is. That is cool. And do people have to go to certain areas or places to be able to do that? You did before, but with the range now, uh, we offer uh, full auto rentals and we do them a part of uh, experiences. You know, we'll do them for bachelor parties, um, company outings. It's really a way, it's, it's, a, it's a great team building or team bonding experience. I mean, you can go spend five hours on a golf course with somebody. Uh, and for me, I'm not that great of golfer. Um, or you can spend an hour in a shooting range. And I guarantee you the quality of interaction that you get within that hour of shooting somebody is, is more valuable. It's more bonding. It's more memorable. And, and that's why I love it. Um, and it, it's just, a, it's a great way to bond with people by conquering something or, you know, doing something that requires some skill and a little bit of know-how as well as suspension of, of any fears that may come along with that. So what do you believe has made the gun range so the range so successful? I know that you guys have like your top tier memberships. I don't know if that was innovative. I was like, oh man, this is cool. Like I've never seen that before. What what was kind of the idea? Like how have you guys been able to kind of take a little corner of the market, make such a great experience and continually evolve on top of that? Yeah, and, and that's a great question. And kind of going back to one of your earlier comments where you said, you know, you guys will drive 40 minutes to, to come shoot. And I appreciate that. I felt the same way. So I lived in Florida a long time ago and I had a, a chance to experience shooting at a different at a range that, that was there uh, that did it differently than any place else that I had been, which then sort of precipitated this sort of notion that why don't we flip the way uh, firearms are sold, uh, you know, and, and move into a more customer centric model and really you know, the old paradigm of buying a gun was that you go into a gun store and you'd have some crotchety guy who wasn't really, you know, all that interested in helping you and maybe a, a, a tad bit condescending if you asked the wrong questions about the gun you were looking at. And, you know, we, we wanted to take that sort of fear factor out of the equation. Let's, there's, no, there's no reason to come in and ask, you know, feel, feel uh, you know, bothered about asking the wrong question. That's okay. There are no wrong questions. So, you know, kind of taking that away, being more open, uh, you know, allowing, you know, giving people iterative feedback, you know, what safety is number one is, is our first primary concern at the range, but all of our range safety officers that are out on the, the lanes when people are shooting, most of them are instructors as well. So they're looking for opportunities to give out uh, advice to people and, 
you know, those, those little 10 second conversations about, you know, why don't you uh, change your grip this way or change your feeding, your, your, your footing a little bit. Those comments are what keep people coming back to us. And it's really the members of the range that make the model work because within the firearms industry, you know, if we sell a firearm, uh, let's say a, a pistol, a Glock pistol, our margins are relatively fixed. We have 17 to 20 points that we're, we're pulling from, uh, from the sale of that firearm. And that's about it. And it moves up as you go into ammo and accessories, it gets more and more healthy. But as we move into membership or training at the range, those are our more profitable, our most profitable areas. So for us, when we looked at the numbers, we couldn't just do a gun store and make it work. We needed to have the range part of the equation um, and that's really what keeps the, the lights on is the, the membership that we have. Yeah, you should try going to gun ranges with a California license. <laughs> then, then, you, then you get looked at. I went to Pennsylvania and they were, as soon as I pulled out that license, they were such jerks. Like they, yeah, they were, they were so rude. And even here I'm like, Hey, like I live here. I actually live right down the street and I can't even buy a gun until I get that license. My wife has her license and has her guns here right now that are, uh, buying a gun in Texas. I think it's 90 days showing that we live here and then also a driver's license, something like that. So anyway, I was like, when I had my California's license, I was going into places and wanting to shoot and people are jerks. And I think that is true that people imagine if they know nothing about guns. And for me, I didn't really grow up shooting handguns or assault rifles or submachine gun, all these little types, like all these different type of weapons. I grew up shooting shotguns because we hunted birds and right. pheasant and duck and that's what I grew up with. So I was like, Hey, like I, I was asking questions and like, they expect everyone else to be as knowledgeable as them. It is really annoying. So that's cool that you guys take that other level. Cause I, I believe that's what it takes to be really good inside of your industry is knowing that market. You said this many times before is that you tested it and figured out in this community, is this something valuable? Right. And most people, they try to impress all the people that are like them, all these like gun enthusiasts. So they don't want to talk about the simple things that people go, oh, this guy's talking about this again. Like, uh, this is how you clear the gun or something. But that's like what people need, or at least right. the people that are buying the guns actually need. All these other people, they, they already have guns. They already know what they're doing. They don't want training, whatever. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's really cool that you guys are doing that. I know that uh, just because I want to make sure you get into it, on your side, like you're a super big car enthusiast. Tell me more about that. Uh, you know, I... I, lo I love, there, there's probably two things I love more than uh, um, than anything else in this world, and that's shooting firearms or driving cars fast. So I think adrenaline is clearly something that courses through my veins, or at least I, I, I like to have it coursing through my veins. And the great thing about driving you know, cars fast on the Circuit of the Americas track that we have here in Austin, or shooting a machine gun for that matter, is that the adrenaline rush is the same every single time. It never gets old. Um, and I, it keeps me on my toes, keeps me focused. And, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, shooting a, a, a submachine gun at the range or driving down the back straights of Coda at 170 miles an hour, I really have to put all of my energy and focus into either one of those activities, um, which is great. And so it removes all the background noise, just allows, I have to be present uh, in what I'm doing uh, at that time. So having had some success in the firearms industry, I've been, I've been very blessed to parlay that into uh, my collection of, of, of automobiles and uh, not just collecting them, but, you know, putting them to the test out at, uh, out at Coda. And, uh, you know, if I had my ideal dream day, it's probably shooting at or uh, driving at the track and then, you know, shooting afterwards at the range for an hour or two, which we, we do often. That's about as good as it gets for me. That is cool. I actually had Mike Dillard on the show oh, yeah, I know Mike. a, a couple guy. months ago. Uh, he, he goes with Porsche, I believe out there yeah. and rents the track and everything. So then it got me going, I'm like, man, like I'm an off, I grew up doing off-road stuff and I'm like, man, I, I love competition is my biggest thing is I, I just love time and getting better and just seeing, I don't know, just having that thing that just makes you be a little bit better beating your own times or yeah. beating other people's time. So we actually on Friday, we're going, doing the little carts at K1 speed or whatever it is and, uh, have a bunch of people that are going to do a little race there the mini 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 version of what you're doing out there on the track tell me what's tell me like your favorite cars entry level all the way to like what you like to drive tell me about it yeah I, you know i i think if if i was gonna you know start off with any car if i had a if i had to have one sort of uh one car to hit the track with out of out of the cars that i own it, it would be probably my four uh ferrari 48 pista that car is so dialed in um 
it's kind of like, it almost feels like a cheat car. It makes a, an average driver like me a little bit better just based on the car that you're driving. So I, I'm a huge fan of, of Ferrari and even kind of saying that out loud to you, uh, it, it makes me smile a little bit because, you know, if you would have told the 12 year old Grant that he, he'd be in a position where he was selling firearms, one of his favorite things, driving Ferraris, one of his you know, favorite icons as a kid, I'm not sure he would have believed you. Um, but it's, it's, it's worked out to be that way. I've, I've been blessed to where saw an opportunity, kind of went all in on that opportunity. Uh, and then the flip side of that risk is the reward. And you know, being able to um, uh, take some of that money and put it in the things that, that I like doing, like driving or increasing my firearms collection, um, has been a real joy and, and a real... Uh, you know, the fun part of, of, of the risk equation is being able to, to enjoy some of the rewards. And people can see that. Just go check him out, Grant Shaw, on Instagram. Type in his name, he'll pop up. You'll see the cars. If you don't see the cars, not him. Uh, but if you see the cars and guns, then you'll definitely know that it's him. I mean, my, uh, my, outside of, Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you're I was going to say, my, my, my Instagram, uh, the, the way in which I look at social media is I just post pictures of stuff that I like. I mean, it's really that simple. Um, so it's usually when I'm, if I'm out of the track, I'm taking pictures or if I'm shooting, I'm taking pictures. It's just stuff that I like. Uh, and it's been really fantastic just to put that out there. And sometimes my captions are in more detail than the other captions that I put out there. But it, it's just fun to put that out there and see people react. And especially having the two sort of disparate communities, kind of bringing them together and finding some commonality. Is that People who tend to like firearms also tend to like fast cars or off-roading or some sort of you know, motor speed, motorsports activity, there, there, there's a lot of continuity there. And it's, it's, it's fun just to kind of fly my, my flag and have other people uh, appreciate that. I'm blessed in that regard. I believe everyone has passions though, that, that do have commonalities, even with their business. You know, I, a long time ago, like I used to just make content and do things about business and I never shared any of the things that I like to do, not even thinking that that might get people that like to do those same things interested in what we do in business. They're right. so interested. Like you had these commonalities, these overlaps. That's what gets people to know us, like us, trust us to even do business. The fact that you drive cars might be a reason why someone goes to your range over other ranges or buy something from you over something else or the opposite. They may be like, man, like I love, I love what he, what he's always driving Ferraris. Like I love this guy. Like I want to go to the Ferrari dealership and tell them that I want to buy a car because this guy's driving it. So I just think it's a really cool thing for, for everyone to do is that back in the day you were limited by the place that you lived in. If you lived in Buffalo, New York, then drive talking about Ferraris, no one could buy one in the area. Most likely the, the economical impact, the average household income, it just should have been a place that there was no market. That's why there's probably not a Ferrari dealership in both Buffalo, New York. Nowadays, though, you could reach a couple billion people just through social media, meaning that if you're into something like knitting and you're a business owner, there's probably a few hundred thousand other people that are knitting business owners or knitting people that need what you have. And they will have that commonality because you can reach so many people outside of your current location. So I think that's a cool thing just to kind of pull out for people listening is that you're showing the things that you love and you're not so unique that you're the only person that loves those things. Yeah, and I think that's, that's yeah, that's a, that's a good way of looking at it. Uh, in that my proclivity, I'm not. There's nothing unusual about liking firearms or liking fast cars, um, but uh, you know the the ability to, you know, the best things in life that I that, that I sort of walk away with in terms of remembering are often experiential activities. So driving a, a car fast on the track, or uh, taking it off road, or uh, you know shooting a firearm, those are all very experiential for me. Uh, and they, they tend, those, those memories tend to last a little bit longer than, uh, uh, you know, those that uh, don't require so much, you know, focus or involvement. So I, I really like the experiential side of things. And I just love sharing that with people. It's, it's fun, whether it be guns or whether it be driving around the track at uh, ridiculous but safe speeds. Uh, either way, I, I just love sharing that experience, you know, living, having, living vicariously through people and seeing them smile or seeing them you know, their either sense of relief or sense of satisfaction, perhaps that comes from uh, shooting a firearm or, or, or being in a car uh, at, at, at fast speeds uh, that just can't be measured. It's invaluable. So to wrap us up, I appreciate you first off sure. sharing and, and investing the time with us. The last thing I want to jump into is that our, our goal is to redefine what it means to be a businessman. I was 60 pounds heavier and I realized that I wasn't able to show up in the workspace. I would have never even met my wife. 
I saw my dad on that side of, of like just working and not taking care of these other things. Or I see people that are healthy, have a family, but then like they do something they hate their whole life. Like you would have been stuck doing if you didn't make that transition. So there's this weird spot where we were talking about earlier of there's like masculinity and there's femininity and there's these guys wearing dresses every single day and all this stuff now. And then there's these, these women rising up and, and conquering things and taking things on with this old traditional way that we see how things have been done with Kings and Queens or maybe our dads and stuff like that. And it's, there's no real like good example or definition uh, from your side of, of just living the life that you live and the, the work that you do. Maybe you can touch on some of these things of some of the core principles of, of good masculinity and, and how we could show up with still embracing the changes from the old masculinity, meaning, you know, like I'm wearing this flower shirt because my right now I'm just trying to have fun. The fact that it was snowing the other day, like I'm going <laughs> to Florida on Sunday. So I'm wearing my Florida shirt in this interview yet. Maybe back in the day, like a couple of years ago, people, like, oh man, you freaking queer or something like that. Right. Like that when I first actually put on my first coat jacket and a watch and loafers, I was like, I'm not even going to put them on in front of my dad. Cause I was afraid. I thought my dad's going to be like, Oh, I freaking queer. Like that's what I thought my dad was going to say, judge me. And that wasn't who I was. Right. Like maybe even driving a Ferrari. wasn't like, be like, Oh, like whatever, who cares that guy that's like old school masculinity. When you talk about it and you talked about this, even with gun ranges or, or people that sell guns, there's a stigma. And so because of that, you get lumped into this. They think, Oh, they're going to be rude to me, et cetera. What are the common maybe things that misconceptions, the bad things that you see in masculinity right now that people should kind of do away with some of the positive things in it that we should keep and, and some of the innovation of that. I'd love to just hear your thoughts on that before we wrap up. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, you know, I, I think that you know, we, we have seen a lot of, uh, you know, when we, it's generational. I mean, if I look at how my parents uh, were raised versus how I was raised versus how I raised my daughter, you know, Things have things have changed, and those things have been impacted greatly by technology. Um, and you know, being able to see all walks of life and being being exposed to different aspects of our culture, I I think we have to also bear in mind that it's okay to uh, value where you've come from um, and who you are. And so, you know, I have a six year old daughter, uh, and I you know I love her to death, and uh, I often joke that one of the reasons I got into the firearms industry was because I have a daughter and someday she'll be a dating age. And I, I wanted to have some form of intimidation factor with her potential suitors down the day uh, when that happens. But I, I you know, I think it's I, I think it's I am who I am and I respect people for who they are. Uh, but I, I don't really cow, um, cow tail to, to, to pressure to to be anything other than who I am. And for me, both of my primary sort of, of ways of, of making money, um, as well as just enjoying myself, happen to be in the firearms industry, which by and large has been a, a large, a very male centric uh, industry. Uh, but I think that's starting to change and change for the better in that we're getting a more comprehensive uh, slice of what America looks like in the range, regardless of race, religion, sex, um, it's it's you know those things really go out the door. It doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, you know the, the the gun range is the great, the great equalizer, and that's part of probably you know it goes back to to why if you look at our Second Amendment rights, you know the right, why the right to bear arms was so important is that firearms are the great equalizer. Um, you know back in the day it was a way to not only put food on your table but also prevent food from being taken from your table, uh, whether it be from you know neighbors, the government, whatever it might be, it, it is a great equalizer. And so we have to remember with that, with that power comes responsibility. Um, but, you know, I, I think changing the, the sort of stereotypes of, of uh, kind of who we are and where we've come from, that changes over time. But I don't, I don't, I don't see the way in which I, I don't see my masculinity has really been watered down or if anything, it's, it's probably been uh, spiked over the past few years by being able to address things that are stereotypically a little bit more male centric, like driving cars. Or, and, and I have a group of probably 25 guys who call ourselves the track rats. Uh, I've driven with Mike Dillard out there a number of times. They go around the track and we have one um, uh, female driver that's with us. And I wish we had more. And she's great. She's got a McLaren race car. I mean, she's she's gone all in. 
Um, and it, it's great to have more people in, in, in the sport, but I don't think there's any, none of us have changed the way that we act around her. She's just gotten in there and we've all accepted and we we're thrilled to have more people involved. So I, I think, you know, the more we allow people to form their own opinions, but hold true to our own belief in who we are and what we stand for, I think that's, that's perfectly fine. That's awesome. And I like you touched on something small that was not really ruling out and, and pushing out what we had in the past, what we grew up with or who they grew up with, realizing that you talked about gun being a great equalizer, either you put food on the table or you keep people from stealing the food on your table. People don't deal with that anymore. And sometimes they think, well, what's the point of me learning any of this stuff? What's the point of working out if I never have to defend myself until you do? Right. And so sometimes looking back and going, well, what was the value of that then? because maybe I can learn something from that so history doesn't repeat itself. Not that we ever have to be prepared, but ultimately there's the quote that says something along the lines of like the guy who sweats more in preparation or training bleeds less in war. There's right. things, there's some truth to that where it's like, well, I probably should know how to start a fire or I probably should know. And these are things that I'm like, I haven't thought about that until this just happened. Right. And I'm like, dude, I don't like, am I prepared? Like I have some connections, but are a lot of people prepared? So I appreciate you saying that as well. I think that was a great perspective. Dude, thanks so much for coming on the show. I hope we can link up here in person here soon. And maybe I'll love, see you over at the range and we can love, shoot a little love, bit. Yeah, I'd love to shoot with or you. Or drive 200 you miles an hour. That sounds pretty good too. I, Either I like way, that. love to have you, Nick. Awesome, man. Thanks so much again. Uh, where can people check out your stuff and, and go follow you? Is there any specific place? Yeah, you can follow me on Instagram, Instagram at just Gunshaw. Uh, I was going for Gun Show, but that was taken. So I went for Gunshaw. I'll play on my name. I always liked the uh, uh, puns. But uh, follow me at Gunshaw or leave a look at SB Tactical or the range at Austin. Awesome, man. Thanks so much again. Thank you, Nicholas.